Welcome to For the Greater Good, a podcast brought to you by the Independent Grocers Alliance. And now your host, John Ross. Well, hello, IGA family and retailers all over the world. Welcome to the latest issue of For the Greater Good. This is my personal podcast aimed at interviewing industry leaders and talking to them about the things they're doing inside their companies to try to make the world safer and a better place for our children, for our retailers, for our environment, for our countries. And uh, I think you will enjoy this interview because today my special guest is the CEO of Mondelez, Dirk Vanderpoel. So Dirk, thank you for being on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, John. Thanks for having me and uh, looking forward to have a good conversation. Well, so, uh, so Mondelez and, uh, and the role that you play there as the, as the CEO, I think everyone, everyone who sees this will recognize you and your role in the business. But I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about your background and then your interest in advancing the company's interests in sustainability. Yeah, yes, sure. Um, well, um, I am from Belgium. Uh, but these days I am a, a Bel Belgian citizen and a U.S. citizen. Um, I am a veterinarian, which might surprise a lot of people, but that's what I graduated in. I, uh, of course, my family is, is the most important thing in my life. I have a wife, Caroline. We, this year we're going to be married for 30 years. Wow. And I have two sons, Max, who lives in London, and Zane, who lives in Miami. Um, if I think a little bit about what, what am I uh, interested in and, and what's important to me else than the family, uh, of course, I became a veterinarian. So anything that has to see with animals and so on is, is very important for me. Nutrition, that's where I started my career in pet nutrition. Um, and uh, that has led me into the consumer goods world, more uh, specifically into the food world. Um, Maybe another interesting thing to know is that uh, while I was a student, um, I uh, started with a number of friends, uh, what's called a pirate radio. Don't know if you ever seen the movie. It's pirate about radio, these yes. boats on the North Sea. Yes. Uh, we were something like that, more on land than on the sea, but same, same type of radio. And um, that gave me some sort of experience uh, to be a little bit eloquent. I wouldn't call myself very eloquent, but uh, a bit more experienced than most other veterinarians who are sometimes a little bit introvert. And so when uh, Mars, in fact, was looking for a veterinarian with some PR experience, uh, that's how they ended up with me. There was no other veterinarian in Belgium that could fit that bill, basically. So they ended up with a pirate radio veterinarian. And so that's that's how my career started in business. That's how I ended up in business. I was just I was just going to say you're the first of the global C CEOs that I've interviewed that has pirate on their resume. So I'm uh, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, the first time I said that, the, the first time I said that in Mondelez, the lawyers were like, "Well, I'm not quite sure if you're allowed to say that." <laughs> um, but now these radios are legal, so I guess I guess that does it. But the other thing. And I wanted to say is that um, if you're from Belgium, where the weather is really bad, if I can say so, the food is really good. And so another important part of my life, apart from everything that I, that I was saying before, is that food has always played a big role. Um, and so I've, I've started in pet food, but I, I have a long career with food companies. And uh, I, I think food plays an important role in people's lives, not only from a physical perspective, but also from an emotional a connection perspective. It brings families together. And particularly in Mondelez, we're basically a biscuits and a chocolate company. Um, we have these brands who are linked in with the culture of a country. And the chocolate you grew up on is a chocolate you will love for your life and you will spend your time convincing your kids that that's the best chocolate there is, basically. So, sure. I hope you do like Hershey, which is the chocolate in the US. Uh, I'm from Belgium, where Cote d'Or is, is very important. So we have all these brands around the world who are so closely linked to local cultures. And that's also a big passion of mine, too, to understand the food culture in different countries around the world. So 
I don't know if you want me to keep on going. Might might get less and less interesting, but that's a little bit about myself. Well, I think that's great. Uh, so so you're heroic in my family. My my daughters are and my wife are huge chocolate fans, and so uh, every time I travel and bring back <laughs> chocolates from the round from the round the globe, many of which are yours. Um, for, for, for a moment, my job looks uh, looks interesting to them, and then they get bored with me and move on. <laughs> um, so you and I sit on this board. Uh, it's the Consumer Goods Forum, and a lot of you know, a lot of U.S. retailers don't really know what that is. I mean, it's it's almost every major CEO of ma uh, of a major CPG company and some beverage companies as well as as well as some of the largest retailers in the world. And you know, for a CEO of a company. I mean, you've got a tremendous demand on your time. You have to be very purposeful. You've made a choice to be a part of this particular board, which mission is about sustainability. I thought you might talk a little bit about your you know, your interest in them and uh, and the role that you serve in leadership with, with CGF. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I, I think the interesting part about CGF is, first of all, it brings retailers and manufacturers together. The second part is that it is uh, global and it goes from very big companies to uh, very local uh, companies. And so I do believe that in the subject of sustainability and what uh, industry and retail should do about it, it's virtually impossible to do that on your own. So I see the CGF as the main vehicle that can drive change in both of our areas as it relates to sustainability. Uh, and that's why I, I am prepared to, to spend my time there and to contribute in a, in a major way. As a company, um, we, we also have to accept that we cannot do everything. Um, just on one subject, the, the task is daunting to make a difference. Right. If you then start multiplying the number of subjects, we, we, uh, it, it's just too much. And so what we have decided to do is to focus on those areas where we as a company really can make a difference and also those areas which are the most pressing uh, for for the environment and so we the the cgf works through what is called eight coalitions of action which are eight subjects and um, and we try to participate in four so one of those subjects is food safety um, around the world and m many of new of, of your Retailers might know this, it's called GFSI, the Global Food Safety Initiative. Um, as, as, a, as quite a bit of prestige, it was one of the first initiatives of CGF. Um, and it's obviously critical to our industry and to our credibility as, as manufacturers and as uh, retailers. And it's very important for broader society. It's non-competitive, so we can all work together on it. Nobody's gonna try to build a competitive advantage on having safe food. Right. Um, and so the, the progress that uh, we are making, I think, is, is very important. Uh, more and more governments want GFSI to come in. So it's basically manufacturers and retailers working with governments, trying to set up a food safety system that works for everybody in certain countries. Um, we have special programs for smaller producers in developing countries, trying to help them with their food safety. I'm, I'm very proud of that, too. And, and we are starting to zoom in on special focus areas. One of the latest has been the whole area of green leaf uh, vegetables, which particularly in the US has turned out to be a, a bit of a challenge. And how can we develop uh, a more important food safety system? So that's one area that, that uh, we contribute. And, and I happen to be the sponsor. So the, the CGF has a board in which there's all these CEOs of retailers and, and uh, manufacturers. You're, one of them, uh, John, and then uh, some of these CEOs become sponsors of these eight different initiatives of coalition that exist. And so I'm the sponsor for uh, food safety. So um, just, just, just on, yeah, on food ahead. safety, because that's going to be something that's near and dear to every retailer's heart. So we are both customers of CPG manufacturers and local growers and local farmers, and we are dependent upon the quality of the product that comes in. So when people hear you talking about leading a coalition of manufacturers to and try to prove that process, working with local governments, which a lot of retailers may not know, um, I think they'll, they'll be encouraged by that. 
And we as retailers, we also have a role to play because we're manufacturers as well in our delis and in our bakeries and, and we grind sausage. We do all kinds of things. And so whatever standards that a manufacturer is putting into place, like right, as those become visible and as progress is made in improving that, those can become a model for our retailers in order to improve our own processes. And I'm very encouraged by and excited about the progress that you're making in food safety. Yes, yes, you, you, you've got that right. It, by the way, it's not only for manufacturers. We use it also for our suppliers as manufacturers, so which could be ingredient suppliers like cocoa or wheat or so. And you buy also from farmers and we want those farmers to also be, be aware and use GFSI standards. The idea is to create this global way of working in food safety that is transparent for everybody. And so uh, I do think that it has a particular interest for retailers because people Consumers trust the retailers to provide them with uh, safe food. Now, the, the, Dirk, Dirk, when you talk to your board and you say that you are making a purposeful decision to invest in food safety worldwide, um, you know, the, the, the boards of public companies are often, you know, very pragmatic and they want to know how is this going to translate into earnings per share or the rest of it. How, when, when, or if there's someone for the news or, you know, or, or the press it asks you about why your company is engaged in these efforts, how do you answer that question? Well, I, I think the, uh, for the board, it's, it's probably pretty obvious that um, we are all interested as a food industry uh, and particularly as, as manufacturers to make sure that people can trust us, that the consumer can trust us. And that we have to do that together, because if one of my colleagues or uh, uh, companies, peer companies, has a major food safety issue, that indirectly reflects on, on us too. And, and so we want to make sure that we do all that together. So I think the board understands that. They also understand that if there is no coordinated system around the world, this can get very fragmented, very complex. Um, if, if I would approach you and your retailers and say, hey, we have our own food safety system, it's really good, trust me. Well, you'd rather hear me say, well, GFSI has checked us and uh, they've, they've decided that our food safety approach is the right approach. So they also understand that one unique system around the world is very beneficial uh, for, for everybody. So those for me are the two big reasons why a board and, um, uh, potentially also the media would be interested. I think there's another uh, level for the media, which is to, to know that the companies that provide them with the consumers with food, that they are taking this very serious and that they are working together to get one coherent, uh, reliable system. And, uh, and I think they, sh they should understand and that governments want to get involved so that everybody is trying to collaborate in making something happen. So I think for them, that should be another reason to understand why this is important. We'll, we'll put a link up to this coalition within the CGF website so that any of the people watching this show, if they want to learn more about what's going on in food safety at the CGF level, that they can click on that and learn. And of course, you're going to see all the partner companies that are involved and it's a who's who's list of, uh, of uh, everyone in our industry. A little bit about Mondelez. Uh, so what is Mondelez specifically doing either on food safety or some of your other sustainability, sustainability issues that you're really proud of? Yes, so um, as I was saying before, we, we, we don't wanna do everything because it's, it's a lot of work and we wanna do it serious. So we use two filters. One is we want to be leaders in sustainability and, 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 and be sort of a, 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 a really important participant where we matter the most as a company. And secondly, we also want to make sure that we drive change where the world needs it most. And so if you, if you boil that down to what we do, largely biscuits and chocolates around the world, there is uh, two ingredients that are very important for us, which is cocoa and weed. And so we want to make sure that those over time, and we've taken a commitment that by, by 2025, we will uh, do so, that, uh, that it's 100% sustainably sourced. And then the other one that's really a focus for us is, of course, to have net zero carbon, like most companies want to do, but also the packaging waste. Um, all our products, imagine a package of biscuits or a chocolate bar, uh, are, play, uh, are packaged in flexible plastic. And 
flexible plastic is a little more, more difficult to deal with than PET bottles at this moment for recycling. Right. So those are our focus areas. If you boil that down one more level, um, it's really about uh, creating a 100% sustainably sourced cocoa and wheat supply chain. That's one. The second one is to make sure that um, in those supply chains, it's, um, there's a number of problems, particularly in the cocoa supply chain, which has to see with deforestation. Cocoa comes from uh, particular regions in Africa, mostly, where the farmers sometimes cut down the forest, and that has a huge environmental impact. Those farmers are, are, are usually relatively poor um, and, and they need to make sure, or we need to make sure that they get a decent income. And so we, it's, it's a wider problem than just taking care of uh, the sustainability of the supply chain. It's also socially important. So that's the second big uh, focus area for us to make sure that we create communities in our supply chain that are economically and socially resilient. The third one is about that net zero carbon I was talking about. And there you have to think about, it needs to be a landscape solution. If I'm looking at a cocoa farmer here that is uh, trying to preserve the forest, but his neighbor is growing palm, oil, palm and he's cutting down the forest. Well, we need to have a, what's called a landscape solution for a whole area. And so it's not just about working in, in cocoa, it's about how to work a, across different crops. And so we have to participate uh, with other crops like palm also. And then the last one is about finding a way to create a circular economy as it relates to our uh, packaging, our flexible packaging. Those are our four um, uh, priorities as a company. That's really where we have set very specific targets by 2025, by 2030, and also net zero carbon by 2050 with uh, a very important milestone in each one of them in uh, 2030. But we try to make sure that we, uh, that we are very focused because we believe uh, that by focusing on these priorities that we can really make a difference. The other thing to mention is that we, we do realize we cannot do this alone. We need to work together. Like I was giving the example of the different crops in the landscape that you need to work on. So we're trying to make sure that, that it's not a Mondelez approach, but that we are part of any uh, public and private partnerships that, uh, that make sense, that we create them or that we participate in them. So, so, so a great example of the potential there for us to work together is recycling. And recycling laws are wildly, uh, re recycling capabilities are wildly different based on community. Like my, I live in Atlanta. In Atlanta, if you have a separate trash can and you recycle all the things that are supposed to recycle and you think you're doing great and you put it in a plastic bag, the recycling center won't take it. And they don't tell you. Hmm. And so, you know, here you have a massive failure at the local level to be able to allow the shopper to engage in something that the manufacturers have spent all of this money to convert their their, their plastic packaging to something that can be recycled. And we have a fail in one of the largest cities in the United States. That's something at a local level, retailers are often quite influential. They often are mayors of their city. They sit on their city councils and they can be engaged in it. And a question to ask is, as every one of the manufacturers comes on and talks about making judgments about how they're improving the recyclability of, I don't know if that's a phrase, the ability to recycle mm -hmm. plastic packaging, are they are we working at the local community to make sure that there's an outlet for it and if we worked together on that i guarantee you we could make an enormous enormous amount of progress um if, if you were if you were going to stand in front of the iga retailers at our annual event which you are always welcome to come to come to dark you'd be a, you'd be a great speaker but if you're going to stand on that stage and say hey there's one thing that i would ask you guys to be focused on uh or to pay attention to over the next 10 years what, what would you tell them I, I think the that's a difficult one. One, let me let me give you the ones that come to mind. I don't know which one is the most important right away, but for sure the example you gave, because the if you think about packaging and recycling, and and we know that consumers particularly are very concerned about the the issue of uh, packaging waste around the world. Um, it's about creating the right packaging that can be recycled. And we're almost there as a company. Uh, we're at 95% of our packaging is recyclable. The problem is, is it really getting recycled? And the example that you were giving 
uh, is, is a typical example. The infrastructure to create the right uh, recyclability of the whole, uh, the whole supply chain basically is often not there. So if we could already at the source and people could bring their packaging back to the retailers, for instance, and then we collect it from there, that would be great because the problem with our flexible packaging as it goes into the waste stream is very difficult to get it out. And then there's another big step there, which is how do you really recycle it? The technology is not yet advanced and we're doing investments in, in that area too. But that I think with one thing that would come to mind. The other one I think, which is very important, uh, which I haven't mentioned, but the CGF is also working on that is food waste. As, as um, the world, um, as more and more people, and as we are running off, out of agricultural land, we will uh, in the coming decades really face pressure on the supply of food. And I don't know what the exact number is, but we've all heard the number that 30, 40% of all food is wasted around the world. And I think there also retailers can play a particular role. There's a lot of fruit or vegetables that uh, doesn't get bought, doesn't even often get off the, of the land. Um, what to do with that, I think could be very interesting. And I've seen some very interesting schemes of where that is being used, for instance, to make soups or there's, there's a separate supply chain or, or uh, uh, sort of cycle that can be created. Um, also, um, as, as we have expired products and so on, what are we going to do with that? I think that's another big area where retailers can play a major role. That, that would be a, a second one that comes to mind. And then the third one is that um, retailers are in constant uh, contact with consumers, much better contact than we have. And, and so the messaging and driving awareness, driving engagement of consumers, which I think consumers these days appreciate more and more, I think could be an, in, an interesting way of connecting with their consumers and, and jointly help to, to find a solution. So those are the ones that come to mind. Um, if I give it a little bit more time, there might be more, but those, those are the ones that I immediately would think about. No, 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 you, you, you did great. On that last one, um, IGA is in the United States, we're releasing a whole new set of visual merchandising to allow our stores to get credit for what we already do. So your local grocery store is often the highest contributed to the local food banks. We just don't tell anybody. And most of our stores have replaced their lighting and many of their fixtures with new energy efficient. They're one of the heaviest energy users in their local community. And we've made massive strides and improvements there on and on and on. A couple of our retailers, our retailers in, in Australia, for example, have developed a, 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 a partnership with a technology company that allows people to basically uh, become aware of vegetable food and vegetables that are about to expire and that they can buy it for a discount. It's kind of a secondary trade market. It's very, very clever. And they're setting up a formal recycling program in the stores as well because the grocery store is both high traffic, but it's also a great collection point if you've got a system for distribution of it. So we are making some progress there with it. It'd be fun for our teams to sit down together and, and to sort of do some joint planning to see if we can't you know, pick some communities out and engineer some successes the next time we do a call like this and talk about the cool things we did. Yeah. So I got one last question for you, and that is, uh, when you retire, and your wife and your family are all all, all in all in the room, and uh, and the people are getting up and making speeches about you, if you were going to say the one thing I would hope that they would say uh, about me, what would uh, about in the ways that you made the world a better place? Let's narrow it down. What what would you hope they would say? Well, I, I don't think I would be known for one thing to say. Okay, that was his impact on the world. But if I look at the people that are important for me, what I hope each of one of them would say is, of course, my family would say he was a good father and he was a good husband and uh, really proud to have had him as a father. I hope that the, the people in, in Mondelez will say, well, he, he gave the company a purpose. We, we got a clear direction. We were successful as a company. It helped me in my personal life, in my personal development, also my professional development. I hope the retailers will say, they were great partners. It was great time, uh, great time working together with Dirk. Um, if I look at uh, our suppliers, same thing. And most important, I think, I hope that consumers will say, well, um, he helped us see uh, snacking because that's 
main thing that we're trying to do. We, our, our purpose as a company is snacking made right. He offered us a, a wide range of snack offerings, healthy and indulgent, which were made for the right moment. I had a choice and uh, they've helped us to understand how to snack in the, in the right way. If, if that is something that we could evolve in the consumer's mind, uh, uh, I would be very proud of that. The main thing is that I hope my kids will say and my wife will say he was a great father and a great husband. Well, that, I think your priorities are absolutely right. Uh, and uh, if someone ever asked me that question, I'm thinking I'm going to copy your answer. I thought that was great. Well, so, uh, <laughs> so I appreciate you doing this show. This is, this is the, the easiest um, and the most fun thing that I do because we get to talk to people who are already passionate about trying to make in whatever way we can as business people to make the world a slightly better place. My confidence is really high that we can if we just work a little bit tighter together. So thank you for coming on. Um, and the next time we do this, so I'll do a lap. The next time we come to this, we'll talk about maybe some some case examples of stuff that we did together. What we're really proud of where we actually got able to put some points on the board. Uh, Dirk, thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for doing this. It was uh, really good and I enjoyed it and uh, looking forward to one day maybe be back and talk about what we did together. I, I promise we will. Um, thank you guys. Thanks for watching.